Excellent. Hello, everyone. Happy National Tree Day. My name is Kelly, and I'm a program coordinator with Burlington Green Environmental Association. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the special night where we're celebrating trees. Kyle McLaughlin joins us tonight as our master arborist and is the City of Burlington Supervisor of Forest Planning and Health. And we are very excited to dig into this topic and learn more about trees. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment for a land acknowledgement. And this land acknowledgement relates to where we do our work in Burlington, Ontario. If you're joining us from somewhere else, we encourage you to do your own land acknowledgement where you are. We respectively acknowledge that our work within the community takes place within the bounds of the treaty lands and territory of the Mystic Sagas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee peoples. This is, land is covered by Treaty 14, the, lake of, the head of the Lake Treaty. We honor all the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people who've been living on the land since time immemorial, and we recognize their leadership in sustaining Mother Earth. We have the responsibility to honor and respect the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. So everyone, welcome to this Zoom webinar. You'll see that your video and microphones have been disabled for tonight, but you are free to ask any questions, throw them into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Or as some of you start testing out, you can use our chat feature to say hello, add in comments, anything like that. And today we're also doing a special prize draw. We're giving away a $50 gift card to Conan Nurseries. Everyone in attendance will be entered in a draw for a chance to win, and we'll pull the name for that after the event. And the lucky winner will be advised by email. So a big thank you to Conan Nurseries for donating our prize tonight. And we wanted to get things started with a little bit of an icebreaker and thought we would start off by finding out have you ever planted a tree? So I'm just launching that poll. And those are pretty, pretty great stats. It looks like most people here planted a tree, which is really cool, but there's still one person out there We'll get to you yet. <laughs> and we've got one more fun one just to break the ice. And this question is, what is your favorite genus of tree? So it's really a collection of species within each genus. And if you have a specific tree that you really love, you know, feel free to drop that in the chat too. I see some options coming in. We'll just give people another moment or two to put in their answers. All right, and I'll end that poll and let's see. Looks like maple was the most popular and it's a pretty, pretty a Canadian answer, I think. So maybe we can't be too, too surprised by that one. So I'm just about ready to pass things over to Kyle and he's gonna give a short presentation about trees. And then after that, we'll move into our Q&A portion of tonight's event. And we wanna get leave lots of time to cover as many of your questions as possible. Uh, many of you already shared your questions during registration. Um, I have all of those, I've collected them, so you don't need to write your uh, question again in the q and I do have those here. If you didn't um, submit any questions at registration, that's no problem. You can just throw them in the Q&A um, and we'll do our best to go through as many as we can within our time here. So for those who haven't met Kyle before, I'll give you a bit of an introduction. Kyle McLaughlin has delivered numerous workshops and lectures lectures on plant pathology and the relationship between trees and fungus. He is the City of Burlington Supervisor Forest Planning and Health and owner and principal arborist of Ironwood Arboricultural Solutions. He has practiced arboriculture in Canada, the United States, and Australia. And before he became an arborist, Kyle was a wilderness guide. So I'm going to go ahead and pass things over to Kyle. So Kyle, you are welcome to 
turn your camera and mic on and share your screen. We'll just give them a minute to get all set up. Howdy, right. howdy, folks. How do we hear? Uh, can you hear me? Uh oh, maybe you can't. Kelly, give me something. Yeah, there we go. People are using the chat. Excellent. Okay. Uh, <laughs> perfect. Okay. Um, so welcome, everybody. I'm going to just uh, share the screen because it's a lot more interesting than my, my ugly mug. Uh, there we go. Ask an arborist. Perfect. So. Bueno. Okay, so once again, uh, I know Kelly had already said this, but I'll say thank you to everybody who's here, uh, which is a, a dynamic urban forestry collaborative event uh, from Burlington Green and the Burlington Forestry Department. I have to say thank you uh, first and foremost to, uh, to Burlington Green. The, the organization has been really helpful and really supportive of our programs. And uh, it's, it's nice to be able to use this platform to, to reach some of you. It's my hope that tonight I answer some questions, not just on the urban forestry side, but also the arboriculture side. And uh, what is the difference between the two, you ask? Well, we're going to talk about that. First of all, a little bit of my background, been to McMaster, Humber College, um, did a lot of outdoor leadership skills. I, as an arborist, professionally speaking, I have my Ontario College of Trades ticket, um, as well as a diploma from Humber. Um, then I'm an ISA tree risk assessment qualified arborist and an ISA board certified master arborist. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to it, but really at the end of the day, these credentials, as far as I'm concerned, just show that I take the industry seriously. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm perfect. And uh, I really do personally, professionally shy, uh, shy away from the term expert because it implies uh, perfection. And I don't think in any sort of profession dealing with health of animals or plants or humans, uh, we can be perfect. It's, it's a really challenging um, way to go. So moving right along. Um, arboriculture or urban forestry? This is a question we actually get a lot I hear a lot from friends and family because technically through the city of Burlington, I work in urban forestry and through my private practice, I work in arboriculture. So anything that has to do with managing trees in society, that's kind of what we're talking about in both respects to arboriculture and urban forestry. This doesn't have anything to do with harvesting trees or managing trees um, for, for revenue generation because of their raw material use. That's traditional forestry. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about either arboriculture, which is individual trees or a series of trees on an urban lot, or forestry, which is the vast number, the 85,000 plus trees we have to deal with at the city of Burlington and managing all of that. And to make it simple, a good way to look at it is arboriculture is like a doctor. They deal with individual people. Urban forestry, on the other hand, is like public health, where you're trying to deal with the vast number of, of people in the environment, and you have to make decisions and have programs that are based on education, based on management, based on infrastructure. Um, now, if you're going to hire an arborist, I, I encourage everybody to make sure that they have some sort of certification. The International Society of Arbor Arboriculture is our main certifying body. Um, in the province. And then there's also the Ontario College of Trades, otherwise known as the Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities. And they, they're the more trade related side of arboriculture certification. Regardless, this is a, an incredibly dangerous job and it's a very technical job. And if you're hiring someone, I strongly advise you to hire somebody who is certified, qualified, who has their tickets. And remember that when you call someone out to your property, professionals diagnose, amateurs give advice. If you go to a veterinarian, you don't tell them that you need to take something out. You ask them what the best thing to do for your dog is. And the same when we go to our doctors. Generally speaking, we ask the doctors, to, we, we go to the doctors for diagnosis before we go for treatment. And this should be the same when we're dealing with our arborists because we're dealing with something called plant health care. And moving to that point, what do arborists do? There's two sides. Uh, generally speaking, there's the practical arboriculture, that's the climbing, the pruning, removing trees, the planting trees, the taking stumps out, tree surgery is what we call it. And then there's the technical and consulting arboriculture. And that's what we deal with a lot in forest planning and health, plant health care, diagnostics, species selection, risk management. And this can all be done with individual trees or vast portions of trees. Whoop. 
dump the gun there. There we go. So our planting program at the city of Burlington. What's our direction from council? Because we've already had a few questions about this. We are planting 1,650 trees street side this year and then community events. COVID has been a real pain for the community event side of things. However, we're hoping to really get back into that next year, get our, get our hands dirty and uh, get some trees in the ground with you folks, with the community. Um, 1650 trees, as far as I'm concerned, is a great goal, but it's not good enough. Uh, by the end of this year, we should have exceeded that goal by about 100 trees, which is nice. Um, what standards do we have for trees, health or structure? This is a big question because when, when trees come into us, we have them inspected. Actually, that gentleman right there, that's Eric Torkelson. He's our urban forestry technician and he is mainly in charge of the stumping and the planting programs. And we collaborate together on what species are going in the ground, why we're choosing specific species for those areas. And when the, the contractors have a tree delivery, whether those trees are good enough to actually be accepted by us. And make no mistake, when trees are poor, and if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, that really sick looking tree, if they look like that, they're not even getting in the ground. Because as far as we're concerned, uh, not only do we wanna have healthy trees, but if we put a tree in the ground and it dies, uh, that means we have to wait another year before we get a good tree. And then we need to wait until it starts growing. And one of our priorities is to actually get these trees in and have as low, a warranty, otherwise known as a mortality rate, um, as possible. That can be really tough, and we're going to touch on that a little bit today, hopefully. How can you help new trees? So if you have a new tree in your property, or if you have a new tree in your uh, on your boulevard, watering 10 gallons once a week in the high heat season is a really good way to help the trees. A lot of people, they tend to underwater. Um, now, if, if you want to keep your tree healthy, when it's hot, make sure the trees get water. Even when they're gigantic, that goes a long way. Uh, volcano mulch is a very common problem. I see this that happens to uh, city trees as well as private trees. And what I kind of consider it is you're loving the tree to death. Don't do that. We do not want a volcano mulch because what happens when we volcano mulch is we actually help to suffocate the tree and limit the air exchange the gas exchange between the trunk and the surrounding environment and if anybody has any more questions or wants me to delve deeper into that and the biochemistry or the environmental science of it later tonight i would love to um, finally <clears throat> avoid using string, string trimmers around the base of trees otherwise known as weed whackers um, a lot of people what they'll do is they'll try and get the tr the the grass that's growing around the tree and they'll actually damage the tree all the way around we call that in the industry, girdling the tree. If the tree becomes girdled, it shortens the lifespan significantly. It may survive for 10 or even 15 years, but then 15 years down the line, that tree may die. And if you're a homeowner and you've spent a thousand dollars in putting it in the ground, plus that time, that effort to get a tree to a nice, healthy 15 year old state, which is still a fairly young tree, um, it would suck to lose it prematurely. And it's the same for us for the city. And it's the same for the people of Burlington um, as taxpayers. You know, we don't want to put these trees in the ground, pour all this money into managing it, and then all of a sudden have them die because of something that happened in the first couple of years. And it's really hard to track this. So the best way to do it is to talk to residents and say, hey, if you're going to take care of your tree, that's fantastic. Try not to love it to death and try not to use string that are right up against the bark. And this is one of the benefits of mulching because mulching is good. It's just What does our canopy look like in Burlington? While we're talking about the planting program, this is a, I find that, uh, oh, information center back in May, talking about this and talking about the gypsy moth program. Some of you may have been there. Um, I know we've talked about this before, but I think even if you've been here before and you've heard the story, it's really important to know. So what is our current genus distribution citywide? That's 31% maple. Now, for me as a, an urban forest planner and a manager of, of urban forest health, um, this is a catastrophic exposure of risk. If that was targeting maples, Burlington, it would cost the taxpayers a lot of money and we would lose the value of those 30, those 
that 31% of trees. And just to give everybody an example, 31% uh, of an 85,000 tree, can that's 25,000 trees. That's a lot of trees that we, we risk to lose. And that's only the publicly owned trees. So how are we remedying that? Well, if you look on the right side, you can see we've really spread out our species distribution. We've spread it wide. What we want is a dartboard. We do not want a pizza plate. And on the right-hand side, we've got that dartboard. If I'm doing my job properly in 15 years, that's what the whole city is going to look like. But right now, we've got a little bit of work to do. Um, some questions came through about planting invasive species. The city of Burlington does not plant any invasive species. We do not plant any Norway maples. Uh, we haven't for two years uh, since I, I joined and a little bit before um, the, the Norway maple moratorium has been put on and, and we're going to do what we can to maintain that um, as best we can so that we can mitigate the risk. To give everybody a quick example, um, when EAB hit, and EAB has cost the taxpayers upwards of $10 million. Um, when EAB hit, we had 15% ash canopy. So we had half as much exposure as we do right now with maples. And part of the reason that we have such a high number of maples is not only because of the planning practices of the past, but also because of emerald ash borer. These invasive species can really exacerbate weaknesses and really expose us in ways that 15 years ago wouldn't have been the case, right? Uh, because if we had ash on there, uh, that species distribution would be a little bit more robust. Now, if anybody has any questions about that, be sure to put it in your back pocket. I would love to talk about it. And this is why biodiversity matters, right? Getting back to the ash question, um, some folks in the city are experiencing this right now. We're in our last push to get the, the last of the ash trees out of street side before we start working our way into woodlots. It's a big program and it's a big problem. It's really unfortunate. I, I really like ash trees. I think they're wonderful trees. Um, before EAB came, they were some of the best urban trees. They did really well in tough urban soils. They grew large. They didn't have a lot of root risk. They were fairly easy to maintain. And now we've lost that option. And we've lost that option both because of invasive species and because of a lack of biodiversity. And uh, the same thing happened with elm trees back in the 60s. And the same thing happened with chestnut trees back at the turn of the 20th century. Hopefully we don't have to do that again because it costs a lot of money. And it's not just the removal, it's also the removal of the stumps and it's also the replanting afterwards, right? If you lose a hundred year old tree, it's gonna take a hundred years to replace it. And at that point, if you didn't remove the hundred year old tree, you'd have a 200 year old tree, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, if they can last that long in the city, which is a long shot, but I think you folks out there understand what I'm saying. How can you help mature trees? So. First and foremost, it starts with soil. Everybody looks to the top of the canopy. They're not looking to the ground. And really, whenever we're talking about who we are and what we come from, we always look to our roots. And it's the same with the trees. You got to go back to the roots. And if the trees are in poor soil, that's poor nutrients. Poor nutri nutrients, it's poor nutrition. Some areas of the city have really tough soil. And part of that's because of our development practices where developers will go in, they'll scrape the, the arable soil off, they'll remove all of the trees and then they'll build the houses. And then following that, there isn't any remediation of the soil. This is a, pro this is a process we're actually hoping to remedy in the future uh, by working with developers to say, okay, if we're gonna plant trees here, we're not gonna plant them in garbage soil because it's a waste of public money. We don't wanna do that. We wanna put them in good soil, have these trees last and then provide the benefits that come with trees, including stormwater mitigation, cooling, and then the social and aesthetic benefit that comes with it. Other problems that arise with trees, Abiotic and biotic disorders. And this is something that feel free to ask about um, because there's two different kinds. And this is where site diagnosis is really important. This is why professionals are really important because if you call someone to your property to ask a question about the tree, they should be asking all of these things. Is it abiotic? Is it living? Is it not living? 
right? Street salt can be a really big impact on street side trees, even trees in front of your house that you feel may be a little bit further away. If you're on a busy road, salt can still really impact those trees because it gets into the air and onto the buds. Crazy, I know, but that actually happens. It's a, it's a bigger problem for private residents than it is, uh, and, and especially a bigger problem for us at the city than it is for folks in rural areas, um, but it is a common problem. I will say that. Uh, construction is really a, another big one that people have where they'll, they'll buy a house, they'll try and preserve a tree, but they'll hire a construction worker to preserve a tree, which is like going to a barber to uh, <laughs> fix a broken bone. I mean, it happened, it worked at one point, but really at the end of the day, everybody kind of got together and said, maybe it's better that people that are fixing broken bones focus on that all the time. Maybe they should get really good at that. I think it's the same with construction in arboriculture. Um, it's much better for an arborist to work with a builder than it is to, for a builder to pretend or act as an arborist. And it's unfortunate when you have folks who will buy a property with big, beautiful trees, whether it's a willow, oak, maple, whatever, and they'll try and build around the tree, but the building process actually damages and kills the tree. And then four, three or four years later, that tree is dead. And I, I've come onto sites like that where they say, well, what do we do? And it's like, well, it's a three or $4,000 removal. And they say, well, why, why did I spend all this money trying to protect the tree? And it's like, and this is something that happens often. It's not even anything related to any of the, the normal pests that people expect. The pests, in most cases, the biotic disorders, the bacteria, the fungi, the insects, usually come after the tree in the urban environment, at the very least, they usually come after the tree has been impacted by construction, by compaction, by bad soil, or and especially over mulching, because over mulching is one of those things that uh, killing it with kindness, you know, um, it's not technically an abiotic thing. It's, it's kind of a biotic thing, but it's caused by people. Here is a perfect example of good construction practice. This is in Hobart, Tasmania. You can actually still find this tree on Google Earth. Google Maps, pardon me, or Street View. Um, this is a bike shop. I was in, in Tasmania years ago and I saw this tree. This is a Phoenix Canariensis. This is your, your classic Canary Island palm. A beautiful, big, big spikes on it though. You don't wanna, you don't wanna climb it if you can help it. Um, but interestingly enough, this, this bike shop was expanding. They wanted to build their bike shop bigger. And that, palm was iconic. Now, the thing about Tasmania, they don't have a lot of palms because it's relatively cool down there. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit warmer than we get here, but not by much. So this was a, quite a remarkable tree to have in the area. Well, they spent the extra money and built the building around it. You can see they've, they've got a little sign <laughs> advertising the bikes around. I was amazed. I was driving down the street. I stopped, I pulled in, they have a coffee shop there. And I said to the guy like, well, what, why did you do it? And he said, well, I really like the tree. And honestly, mate, the trees made me more money than the bikes have. Like, really, that was, a, I couldn't believe it. But he, he was explaining that it was such an anomaly. It was such a fascinating thing that folks were stopping by to see this like I did. And in the process, they're grabbing a coffee, they're grabbing a donut, right? They're sitting around. If they're, if they're cyclists, this is a destination for cyclists on the weekends, not only because they can buy their gear, but because it's a cool little coffee shop with a tree built, like built around a tree. And this is something that he spent the extra money on, but at the end of the day, it paid dividends. That was good planning. That was a project that was development and arboriculture working together. Now, moving on to a little bit outside of that, Gypsy moth is something that we're all familiar with. Invasive species is uh, a question that's come up a couple times as well. So I wanted to kind of bring this to attention. Uh, European gypsy moth, otherwise known as Lamantria dispar dispar, or dispar one, you've, it's open for discussion, um, is an introduced pest that impacts trees. A lot of us are familiar with it. We've had a program in the past, we, ha we had a spray program this year. Um, it's my hope that in 2022, we, we continue to uh, proceed with a, another spray uh, because it's a, it's a lot to manage. And this is an example of an insect that was brought over um, from Europe to Boston 150 years ago. 
And the gentleman who brought it over wanted to start the silk trade in Canada. Great idea. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, it got out. And if you look at the history, the first season, it was just down the street from him. And the second season, it was getting out into greater Boston area. And now they're dealing with it up in Sudbury and Thunder Bay. Um, this is what invasive species do. And unfortunately, there's eradication is untenable. We don't have the money or the focus or the, I don't think there's the, the political will to do it. Um, so what do we have to do? We have to manage it as best we can. And what does that mean? Well, that means spraying from time to time, tracking it and trying to do what we can to keep our trees healthy so that they can naturally resist this pest. And how do we do that? Well, we manage these pests through something called integrated pest management. Now I've got a, a plant up here as well as gypsy moth because the, the acronym IPM, integrated pest management, is related to all pests, whether they're insects, whether they're fungi, whether they're plants. How do you do it? Part of it's knowing the, what the life cycle is and using different approaches depending on what, site, what stage of life the pest is in. Um, if they're smaller, you'll use one thing. If they're larger, you, you'll use another. When it comes to gypsy moth, there are a multiplicity of different things that you can do at each stage of life. Now, right now, you won't see any gypsy moth because they've laid their eggs and they, uh, they're going to be, for lack of a better word, away or dormant um, until next May when they begin to hatch and start the process all over again. You can remove those eggs and removing those eggs is actually going to make a, a, a big impact or can make a big impact on the amount that you'll see on your property and the amount of impact that they have. Um, up in the top left, this, uh, this little plant right here, this is actually, I would say, the most invasive woody plant that we have right now, which is known as European buckthorn. Uh, the, the Latin is Ramnus cathartica. If anybody wants me to type that out, let me know at the end. Um, and European buckthorn is a low-lying species. Uh, it outcompetes some of our species at risk, like uh, flowering dogwood. And it's, what it's doing is it's actually following emerald ash borer. So what will happen is emerald ash borer will go into our woodlots, completely destroy the canopy. And because there's no overstory, the buckthorn will reproduce prolifically. And it is incredibly hard to remove. It's incredibly hard to kill. And uh, it's very, very expensive to manage. And so um, <laughs> we, we want to get there. Um, but there's, we're, we have to deal with the AB. And this is one of the biggest challenges of living in a globalized society. Uh, we have every single one of these invasive species either came from Europe or came from Asia. And they, they cost a lot of money to manage and they're, they're big concerns. Now, instead of managing them, there is another better, there is a, a better approach, which is prevention. And that's when it comes to these two pests that we see right here. Um, these are Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, some, some of you may remember it from early, uh, the early 2010s, late 2000s, when it was present in uh, Mississauga and Toronto. Um, it was a very politically touchy situation. Uh, they really pushed to eradicate it and apparently they successfully did. And as far as we know, Asian longhorn beetle does not exist in Canada. However, it does exist in upstate New York. It is from where I am at my house in Brant, Ontario right now, um, an hour and a half away from us. If we drove to the border, um, it is that close and it affects maples, willows, birches, beeches, poplars, and a, a fair portion of others. So something to watch out for. Um, and one of the reasons why we're so careful about maples. And finally, uh, the other one on the right-hand side is spotted lanternfly. That affects more fruits and it will be, uh, we'll hear a lot more about it once it starts to get closer. Right now it's in Pennsylvania and uh, it, it affects, if it got up here, the first people would, who would be talking about it would be Vineland um, because it, it is a big um, predator or big pest, pardon me, of, uh, of your fruit producing species. So finally, uh, what do we need to do if we want to accept the benefits of trees? We need to accept that trees produce litter. Uh, that's a challenge. Nobody wants to acknowledge that, but it is the truth. Um, they all produce seeds, leaves, and flowers. They all produce fruits. Sometimes those fruits are hard nuts. Sometimes those fruits are, are 
sticky fruits like apples. Uh, sometimes they're just seeds or bean pods. And th that can be annoying, absolutely, but it's, it's important. Um, and that's the reality that we have to do. Uh, it's the same with if we have roads, we have to, we have to shovel them. We have to salt them. We have to patch them. If we have trees, we need to manage them as well. It's not a fire and forget. In the forest, that's a different story. But if we want to have them in the urban environment, we need to treat them like infrastructure. Trees will grow. Um, we're planting these. Every tree that you plant, you're planting for, for your children, your grandchildren, your friends' children, your friends' grandchildren. doesn't matter. You're planting it for another person. And that, that, that's a good thing to do. It really is. It goes a long way. Um, and... Uh, and yeah, if anybody has any any other questions, uh, hopefully you have lots. We're gonna move to the Q and A. I have uh, another photo I can move it to, but if uh, Kelly wants to go along, uh, there's another thing on what we're planting at the city. And uh, yeah, first I'll pass it back to Kelly before I continue. How can I do that here? Whoop. Okay. Screen sharing has stopped. I can't. Can I pass it back to you, Kelly? without yeah Ollie, we're, we're good now we're we're back on track there we go awesome okay all right well thank you so much um kyle for giving your talk about trees i mean i know i learned a lot in there and i'm sure everyone else did too we have a lot of questions that came in before and we've got um, a handful that have come in the Q&A in the chat. So I want to give as much time to covering as much as we can. Um, you were just talking about, um, you know, invasive species and there were a couple questions that kind of came in about, you know, invasive species and native species. So I thought maybe we would start with some of those. Sure. Um, so one of them was, what are the, this came from Natalie. What are the most invasive tree species in Halton and how can we recognize them? Oh, perfect. Okay, so the biggest one is uh, is that European buckthorn. And so uh, if we're, we'll go back to, I'll share my screen back with you again, just so that we can really focus on that. Let's see here. Um, we're gonna be passing this back and forth here. Uh, that's okay. Kelly, if it, if it becomes a, a frustrating, let me know. Like, we can Whoa. just keep it on your screen if you've got some things sure. to share. That's fine. Um, so I'll shrink this down. <laughs> now we're in my editing screen, but that's okay. Everybody here has seen, everybody's seen PowerPoint. Um, so if you, we look at the leaves here, uh, so there's what we would call spatulate. So they're, they're like, they look like a spatula. They're kind of oval. Um, they can get a little bit longer depending on where you are. But if you look at the veins, the veins are a really strong indicator. They also have those black um, berries that, uh, that they're, they're out right now. They're really dark, uh, dark bark with lenticels and very much uh, they're low lying and thick. They form thickets that are almost unwalkable. And so if you get up to a place and you're like, oh, like this is, this looks like, I can't walk through this. And I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but if you've been in a buckthorn thicket or if you come up against one, you'll know exactly. And the nice thing is, I hesitate to say nice, but the nice thing is that they, uh, they're they just at that point right now in the next few weeks, as all of the other leaves start to change color, buckthorn will hold its color for about three or four weeks longer. And so if you go out, especially into woodlots that have had EAB ravage them. And you'll know because it's a massive woodlot with all these giant dead can this giant dead canopy, you'll be able to see the interior canopy. If you go up to those areas, they will have a lot of buckthorn and dollars to donuts because what happens is the birds like the berries, which is actually rather unfortunate because the birds are, are spreading it. They're spreading it far and wide. The birds are doing what they're supposed to do with this. And this is exactly how um, the, the European buckthorn or the common buckthorn uh, reproduces in Europe naturally, right? And it's not a bad thing. I think this is what's important to remember is invasive species aren't bad. Um, what they are is they're coming from a non-native environment and they're reproducing at a really high rate and it impacts the native species. So they're not bad, they just exist. And I think it's important to keep that in mind because it's easy to say, oh, that's a bad plant. It's like, no, that's in its environment, that's a good plant. Uh, perfect example, our native black cherry is 
a native tree here. It's really, really helpful. In Germany, it's a terrible invasive species. And, and so it's, it's where you are. It's the environment that you're in. Um, so there you go. So common buckthorn really is the biggest one. Um, other ones, non, so I would say non-native invasives because that's a, another complicated term is what's an invasive species. So non-native, so not from this environment. Um, we would be talking about <sighs> tree heaven exists, but it's not really that invasive. White mulberry is, is everywhere down here in Southern Ontario, especially because it's main, it's main entry point. It's considered to be like main entry point to North America is considered to have been Dundas, Ontario. Um, I've heard stories, I don't know how true they are, um, of immigrants to, to Dundas in the late 19th century, or mid 19th century, pardon me, um, getting there and, and not being satisfied with the native red mulberry and sending home for white mulberries because they were much better for making fruit and pies. And here we are, right? This is something that um, a lot of these invasive species are, are, are either bred from people bringing these things over unintentionally, like without expecting them to, to be as, as damaging because heck, 50 years ago, we didn't have a really strong understanding of ecosystems, let alone 150 years ago, but also because of our globalized trade system. I mean, EAB came in on shipping pallets, um, which is an argument that I often make to folks when, they, when we say, okay, we're talking about invasives. Um, we get things cheap from overseas uh, because manufacturing is cheap, but there are other costs. There are hidden costs. And EAB is actually, I would say, a hidden cost of that. Um, okay. Okay, and just, I guess, a follow-up question, because there, you know, relates to something that came in through registration and some of the comments through is, you know, if people see, you know, this common buckthorn or these invasive or what you said, non-native invasives or however you worded it, <laughs> yeah. like, um, what can people do to help? How, is there anything they should do to manage them, whether it's like on their property or what if they see it in a park? Absolutely. Great question. So if it's on your property. This is where I say call an arborist. I was just speaking to a resident recently who had asked, and I said, well, one of the problems that we have, and I've experienced this even, I mean, I, I've been in the industry for a while. I've worked with people who've been in the industry for five, 10 years. We still misidentify plants. Um, and and I'm, I see it a lot with folks. Uh, it's a big challenge that we have. People see trees and they're like, oh, okay, I know how to identify a tree. It's like, well, uh, the Dunning and Kruger effect says like you're, the, the more confident you are in identifying trees, the, <laughs> the less likely you're going to actually be able to properly identify them. And so if it's on your property, I always say get a second or a third opinion. So go to an arborist or horticulturalist landscaper and say, what is this species? Because you might be re removing something that's native or that is healthy because you've looked at it and you said, oh, okay, yeah, this is definitely a, a common buckthorn, except that the the veins, instead of going in the direction that you're seeing on my screen right now, they go in an opposite direction or they go, they're parallel or they, they have slightly different leaf margin. And then turns out you're actually removing a flowering dogwood, which is a species at risk. Uh Oh, you know, or you're removing a, a red mulberry, which is a species at risk and you you're meaning to remove a white mulberry. So if it's on your property, get a second opinion. If it's, if it's for the city, I, uh, I strongly advise that you call it in when it comes to service Burlington, I say, call service Burlington. Our program strength, our program budgets are decided by council. And so there's a lot of things that I would like to do that we just simply don't have the funding to do. But the beautiful thing is that we live in a democracy and you are responsible for steering the ship just as much as anybody else. And so the things that you say to your counselor, the things that you say to your, your community members, um, groups like Burlington Green actually have a big impact on that. Because if you're saying, well, holy crap, like what are we doing about these things? It, we can open that discussion and I would love to, uh, you know, and, and this is part of what we do in forest planning is saying, how long until we can actually look at dealing with buckthorn? You know, we got to deal with gypsy moth. We have to deal with EAB. We have to deal with Norway maples. We have to deal with Japanese knotweed. We have to deal with common buckthorn. We have to, you know, and, and so the more that the more vocal people are, the easier it is to say to council, hey, we'd like to do this. Can we get your support? And right now we have a, a great council. They're very progressive and they're very helpful. And uh, I found they're they're quite responsive and, and collaborative with with the public. Does that help, Kelly? Yeah, yeah, that's great. 
Um, we've had quite a few questions um, more geared towards tree care. And Great. one of them kind of is a good segue um, to get into that. Um, this was from Jim. Um, he said, we have a 60 plus year old uh, tree trees on our property, oak and white birch in the front and white pines in the back okay. and a small chestnut tree. And they've had evidence of caterpillar. They haven't had evidence of caterpillars um, except tech caterpillars on the chestnut tree. Um, and they removed some branches. Should they be treating trees this fall with a product like Tanglefoot or is there a better product? Can you, can you comment on that at all? Yes, this is like, this is right up my alley. I don't get to deal with this stuff very often. So I, I love it. Um, this is what I deal with in private practice all the time, but it's, you know, rarely do people actually think to ask these questions. Um, oh, so cool. Okay. Uh, sorry. It was Jim. Um, Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, if you can, uh, if you can respond to Kelly on whether or not it's a horse chestnut or a, an American chestnut, that would kind of help give me a little bit of uh, idea as to what exactly we're, we're looking at here, because uh, American chestnuts really quite rare because it was wiped out by the American chestnut blight. Uh, like I had mentioned earlier at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, um, Usually it's horse chestnuts. They're a little bit more sensitive as well. Um, when it comes to only one thing all up from the ground into the canopy and only when they're active. Tent caterpillar, first off, is a native species. And generally speaking, um, depending on which one you get, because this is uh, Interestingly enough, we have forest tent caterpillar and eastern tent caterpillar. You need to make sure you identify them properly because uh, forest tent, for example, is, uh, is oh, I'm going to see if I can pull one up here, uh, forest tent caterpillar. Forest tent caterpillar and eastern tent caterpillar look very similar. One leaves its, uh, its colony during the day and the other one stays in its colony all day. Now, you don't need to know the nuances of the ID to get that. Um, what you do need to know is that if it's there all day, the best way to remove it is to literally just clip it out, right? You use a little pole pruner, you use a little saw, uh, don't burn it out of your trees. Um, I, I know people who've tried to do that and you will damage your tree. And if you burn a tree that's alive, it's like burning your own skin it just turns into an entry point for all sorts of diseases and you're not doing the tree any benefit. So cutting it out specifically and removing it, you'll do yourself uh, some favors. Now I will say, because you have a white pine and a white birch, um, those trees specifically, just be careful if you ever plan to do any sort of construction, expansion or renovation on your home, any sort of landscaping. I deal with a lot of folks who, um, go through this process, they get the construction done and white birch are so sensitive, white pine are so sensitive to construction. Um, and so just beware of that. Um, final point on the tent caterpillars, because they're native, you will see, actually this is true with most caterpillars, you will see an ebb and a flow. So some seasons they'll be really bad and you'll be like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Other seasons they'll be okay. Um, and so removing them when they're active like they are now and then burning them when they're off the tree, that's a good way to go. Tanglefoot really won't do you any good when it comes to the tent caterpillars that stay in all day. Um, and finally, one of the other ways that you can prevent it, we were talking about integrated pest management. Um, tent caterpillars can be a real problem on fruit trees. So what we usually do is we'll aim to prune our fruit trees between January and March, because then when you prune the trees, you'll remove a whole ton of eggs. And then when they hatch, you know, you've removed 70% of them when they were eggs, you don't even have to deal with the caterpillars you, and you only have 30% of a brood that's really a headache. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jim. Yeah, and I think they just um, added in the in the the chat that um, they they weren't sure about the type of chestnut, but it's young compared to the, the oak and pines, which are quite old, I believe. Okay, um, I'll put, uh, I'll just leaf there. There we go. So what I'm going to expect is that this would be Jim's leaf right there. That's a horse chestnut uh, being Aeschylus hippastinum, hippo meaning the Greek for, for uh, horse, pardon me. Um, these ones have the spiky balls, right? The spiky chestnuts that are inedible. Um, the American chestnuts are the ones that are furry, that are delicious. 
Cool. That's awesome. Um, I guess moving on to some more uh, tree care, we had a lot of questions come in about dead branches and dead limbs and, um, you know, how to manage them. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with um, a question that came through from Chantel. And she said, when are there dead branches, when there are dead branches, is it better remove them from the tree or leave them? And another related question from Tom is like, is there an acceptable amount of dead branches to leave on without intervention? Ooh, great. Okay. So uh, first of all, when, when to prune the tree um, as far as its cycle is concerned. So you've got a small tree. Um, I, I think it was an elm. So to remove or to not remove when they're young, generally speaking, you can, if they've been planted after three, three years after they've been planted, if they've just been planted, I generally say don't prune for the first three years. Let the tree figure itself out and it will self prune. It will actually divert resources from leaves that aren't generating enough quote unquote revenue, AKA sugars, and direct those resources to healthy branches. If you go through and you prune the tree in its first few years, and it hasn't kind of figured it out, you're actually going to harm, you, you could harm the tree. Now, bear in mind, always pruning is wounding, uh, but when you're removing dead wood, sometimes it's better for the aesthetic, sometimes it's better for risk management. If it's a small tree and say it's five years old, it's 10 years old, that pruning can be aesthetic mainly. Um, one thing that you do wanna watch out for is if you have a small tree that is healthy, and those lower branches don't naturally self prune. Sometimes the lowest branches can start to go out and out and out, and then they start to go up and up and up. And sometimes, and I, I've walked on properties like this after 20 years, where the, the lowest branches are actually at the top of the tree. You see this a lot with sugar maples and, and you can kind of see it with some elms, but not as many because we don't have a great sample size with elms. Um, Norway maples will do it though. There you go. Um, and then the interior of the, the tree will actually get shaded out and it really shortens the longevity of the tree. And it makes it a lot harder to manage and to prune too. And so I would say that if you if you get to 10 years, those lower branches are still healthy and robust and they're still growing. Um, I would consider pruning it. And if you're ever at a point, you're like, oh, I might like just completely destroy this tree. Because if you're doing anything like a, a pinky size, you should be fine. Um, if you're doing anything over 10 centimeters or four inches, call a professional because that's a big wound. And trees have a really hard time sealing wounds over like that. Um, and so if you're doing like, oh, okay, this is about four inches, or it's about 10 centimeters. If you call someone like myself or another arborist on site, they might be able to walk on and say, yeah, you don't need to remove the whole thing. You can actually prune it and manage it. And then you're not leaving this massive wound on the tree, which is going to invite decay and stress the tree out. Um, there was another question there, Kelly, about uh, newly planted trees. Um, so what is the acceptable amount of dead branches to leave on a tree without intervention? Right, there you go. You could, uh, as many as you want, <laughs> really. Um, in that case, when it comes to like the long-term health of the tree, you can, you can leave the branches there naturally because that's what would happen in the natural environment and the tree would self prune. That is a normal thing. Um, in the urban environment, typically speaking, I say we the, the best reason to deadwood is for risk management. So I'm worried about that limb coming off and bonking me on the head. That's when you remove it. Um, the second reason for pruning would be aesthetic. And at that point it's like, it's your choice. Um, at, at my home, we have 45 different species of trees. We've got some really big ones. I don't take the deadwood out unless it's an aesthetic tree, like some of our apple trees I'm, I'm per quite particular about, but some of our larger pines and spruces, I leave the deadwood in because I'm not concerned about it. And it's not unsightly, it's just in the canopy. Cool. Okay, what about, um, this is from a, an anonymous uh, attendee. What's the best time to trim a maple tree? Ooh, um, generally speaking, the best time to prune trees, and, and this is something that we could argue until the sun comes up. Um, but professionally speaking, I say it's March, um, right when the sap gets flowing, because what you can do is you're not stealing any of the sugars from the tree. Um, if you're pruning the tree in leaf out, um, like, like now, for example, all of the pieces, all of the leaves that are on there, all of those sugars that are on those leaves, they're gone, right? You're removing them. The tree never gets those sugars back. Pruning is wounding. You're wounding the tree. Now we know that in the industry and 
in an operational context, we can't say, okay, our industry only works <laughs> from February until April. It doesn't work that way. Um, but if we have a choice, generally I say, if you come in in February or March, the buds are closed, the sap is beginning to run, you can actually direct where that sap flows based on what you prune. Now, if you, you can do something similar by pruning in October or November or December or January, um, but the, the risk that you run at that point is that when you prune, although you're not taking nearly as many sugars as when you prune in September or, or in August, what you are doing is you're pruning the tree and leaving these open wounds when pathogenic fungi are most active, right? This is a perfect example. A day like today, there's mushrooms everywhere. It's been warm and cool and warm and cool and some rain and no rain. And then we're going to get tons of rain. And over the next few days, we're going to see tons of flushes of mushrooms. And so pruning in October, November, although has some benefits, will expose the tree to a little bit more risk long-term. But if the tree is healthy, that's not a big deal. Remember that these, these organisms are incredibly robust. They've been through a lot. They live for hundreds and hundreds of years. In some cases, some of them have outlasted countries, right? Our oldest tree in, in Ontario is over 2000 years old. Uh, you know, so these things, they're robust, they're tough. Um, and so I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I just wanted to do a quick check in, let people know we're only five minutes away from eight o'clock. We have cool. a lot more questions. If Kyle, you have the time, we can keep going through some of them for With everybody. Pleasure. Yeah, for everyone, just to know we, we, we are recording it. If for some reason you're not able to stay through, your question hasn't been answered yet, um, we'll do our best to keep going through as many as we can. And we'll send a, a, a link to the recording after the event and you can always um, find your answer in there. Um, so we'll keep plowing through. Um, Derek had a question um, about a cedar tree. Um, he asked, how can a cedar tree die on only one side? And is there anything that can be done to save this? So to save those that are dead or dying on only one side? That's a, a, a great question. So uh, this is, uh, it's interesting that you say this, the oldest species of the or oldest trees, top five in Ontario, I believe are all cedars. I know the top, top two definitely are. Um, cedars can, can last a long time. And sometimes if you have one side of that tree that's dying, especially when it comes to cedars, because cedars are weird like this, um, I, would, I would go to the root of the issue. Um, any construction, what's the site history? Like, why is that happening? Usually if one side of a tree is completely dead um, and the, the other side isn't, my first thought is that it's not something that's a living that's done it. It's usually something that's abiotic. So I look at around. Did a pool go in recently? Did you put a fence post in that may have gone through one of the main major routes? Did you have any construction that maybe had a big machine continually run over one side of the tree, but not the other? Um, because roots generally will feed the side of the tree that those roots are growing on. So if you have a, a, a major structural root, which you think of that like a highway because it transports a ton of nutrients, a big piece of the tree's infrastructure, um, you remove that, everything on the other side of that root is going to be toast. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know, it's, it's really in the tree's hands to, to do what it wants to do. Now, bearing this in mind, if you've lost that, and if one side of the tree is dead, um, this is where diagnosis is really important. Because in this circumstance, I would walk on site and I would look at how old are the leaves? So did the leaves die this season? Did they die last season? Did they die um, two or three years ago, right? Um, if the, depending on the color of the leaves, depending on the, the desiccation level, that can actually give a really big um, idea as to what the diagnosis is. Because if they died really, really quickly, then it's like, you must have lost a root like this year. But if, if you went out and you, you've been looking at it slowly dying over the years, then that would indicate that perhaps it is something that's, biotic. Perhaps it could be an organism like a, a, an insect pest, or it could be a fungus. But generally speaking, when those, when, especially when it comes to a fungus, affects the roots of a tree, the tree's toast. Like it's, the tree will go. You won't see like one half of the tree go and then the other half, especially when it comes to a cedar. So what I would say is look at your roots, look at your site history, and, uh, and you might be able to get on the right track. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, this was a question that came um, from Edith. Um, she said, my husband wants to prune off the lower branches of the Amer of our American elm tree. Yes. The lower portion is currently bushy. I see this as being naturally occurring, but they seem to lose them as they age. I prefer to just let it be. Should these branches be pruned? There we go. So this, uh, with this American elm, depending on the size, I would say if it's anything above 10 centimeters, um, you can prune those lower branches, no problem. I would say prune them early spring. Um, yeah, prune them early spring. If they're, if they're alive and the tree is newly planted, leave it. But if you're saying like it's, how old did she say, Kelly? Did she say an age there? No, no age was noted. Okay. Um, and so if, if we're bearing in mind, if it's pre five years, I would leave it. If it's after five years and you're doing less than 10 centimeters uh, of diameter worth of damage in each of these limbs you're removing, I think you should be fine. Uh, the, the rule of thumb is we never want to remove more than 30%. And oftentimes I say less is more. Err on the side of caution because you want to keep your trees healthy. That's great. And we've got um, one more that uh, is specific to more tree care. And this came from Chris. He has an old oak tree about two feet diameter. Last year, noticed some bark on one side of the base that was ballooning outward. And this year, a piece about three by 12 inches broke off, revealing the, the outer bark separating from the inner. The tree appears healthy otherwise. Should, should he be worried, um, do oak trees shed bark? Huh, great question. Uh, Chris, I, I, I like it. Um, a challenging one. So the first thing that comes to my mind, uh, if you're seeing bulging, that could be a burl or it could be a canker. Um, a burl is like, you know, how folks get old, we get boils on our skin. It's just the skin proliferating a little bit too much. It, it's a lot like that with a burl. Um, they happen a lot on willows. They happen on walnuts and oaks as well. Um, another term for it, if the burl is right around the base of the tree, is a lignotuber, um, as in like a woody tuber. Um, that's more your eucalyptus species, though. You don't see that a lot in North America. But that being said, that's kind of the purpose of, of what a burl is, is that if the rest of the tree dies, something can sprout out. Um, and it's usually just like a, a concentrated mass of wood. Um, alternatively, if you're saying the bark is popping off, like that's not, a, that's not normal. Um, it could be a canker. It could be a decay fungus. It could be related to impact. So I've seen that happen where a machine has smacked into the bark of a tree. Like if we're looking at this ironwood right here, you know, it could smack into the bark there and the first couple of years, nothing happens. And then you start to see that sinking in. And then sometimes that bark will just completely die. And for the lay person to look at them, you're like, that just happened. It's like, yeah, the, the bark falling off just happened, but the injury happened two and a half years ago, which is a, a real challenge for us because we really have to do some, some forensics sometimes where it, you know, I'll walk onto a property and a homeowner will say something just like you're saying. And I'll say, well, have you done anything in the last? No, no, it's all been the same. It's like, okay. And then you look around and you're like, okay, well, what about your, your pool house there? Oh, well, you know, they, yeah, that went in in like 2015, but whatever, like, that's not a big deal. Like, okay. Oh, and we did get the tiles done in 2017. It's like, oh, how many tiles? Oh, it's like a $40,000 project. Oh, Okay, so you had a machine in here. Yeah, but like the construction guys were really good. Eh, they might have been really good, but they might have just smacked the tree. Most people don't realize that it's a big deal, right? So figure out what your site history is. And I would say in this circumstance, without sight unseen, without seeing a photo of it, and perhaps if we do this again in the future, we can have some sort of opportunity for folks to send in their photos beforehand. I love that. Um, I would suggest that you call out an arborist that is, uh, that is certified by the ISA or the Ontario College of Trades even, and, and get their opinion. Um, because decay, and this is really important, decay in a tree doesn't mean that the tree needs to come down. It, it is not a death sentence. There are hundreds of trees in Europe that have been standing in street centers and city squares for 200, 300 years that have been maintained before the trade of our boar culture even existed. And so the idea that just because a tree is decaying means that we need to cut it down is, uh, is misguided. 
uh, and, and I think it comes from a good place of risk management and wanting to be safe, uh, but it, it, it fails to really capture the robustness of, of trees, right? If it's a right tree, like an oak, like you're talking about, just because it's decaying doesn't mean, oh, it's, it's got to go, Could if it is decaying. Um, I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Uh, Sharon asks, how long or how long do the roots grow on a red maple tree? And she indicates it is located approximately 20 feet from her house. Okay, um, great question. So when it comes to maples or any tree, trees will, will grow roots wherever it's easiest for them to grow roots. So if you put a tree in a corner, oh, nice, yes, I finally get to use this. Um, hold on, I have... Uh, paint set up for exactly this scenario. No, I don't. Never mind. I thought I did. No problem. Kelly's, <laughs> Kelly's like, we did, we went through this, didn't we, man? Um, okay. So when if you're dealing with it, maybe I can draw a little thing. Nope. There we go. Backspace. I have an interview pointer options. Pen. There we go. We'll make it do. So if this is a driveway right here. Uh, I hope everybody can see this. And then say you've got a sidewalk and there's a tree planted right here. The soil in this area is incredibly compacted. It's compacted because when you put in a driveway, you clear the soil, you put down fill, you compact, you put down gravel, you compact, then you put down asphalt and you compact. And what that does is it makes for a nice solid surface that doesn't move around a lot. In the process of that, if you plant a tree afterwards, typically what trees will do is they'll get to this point and they'll say, well, there's no nutrients. There's almost no water. It's really, really hard to grow my roots through there. I'm not gonna do that. So sometimes they'll go this way and sometimes they'll hit there and they'll go this way. And sometimes they'll actually just senesce and they'll die because they won't have any, any food or water or they'll just get more and more robust in that area. Meanwhile, on the other side of the tree, the roots will hit a spot like the sidewalk. And if the sidewalk is has an issue or if it's old, sometimes they can move and grow underneath the sidewalk with great trouble. It's really hard for trees to do that. And when they do, it's like an immense amount of work for them, but they'll do it if they can get the water. Um, meanwhile, if you have your house, it's 20 feet out this way, the roots can eventually grow in that direction and make their way there. Uh, but one of the important things that we say in the industry, um, and, and this is a botanical matter of fact, trees and their roots do not cause cracks. They exploit them, but they do not cause them. And so if you have a drainage lateral, for example, which we've dealt with before in the city, um, if the drainage lateral is clay, uh, the roots can find that. And usually at this point, after 80 years, the clay laterals have broken down and the roots just get right into people's sewers. And that can be a real headache. But this is something that's impossible to control um, other than pruning the roots, which if we had $100 million in our forestry department, I would be 100% on board with, uh, but we can't do, unfortunately. Um, so bearing that in mind, uh, if you have, say, a, a tree that's 20 feet away from your house and it's quite small, I think you're you're fine. Um, but the big thing to note is, if the, if you're watering, if you're watering on one side of the house, or if you're watering on the house side of the tree, for example, the trees are going to grow more roots in that direction, right? The roots will grow wherever there are nutrients. I remember once when I was consulting privately, uh, working for another company. Um, I was doing uh, what we would call like on-site monitoring. So they were replacing a, a massive sewer lateral in uh, in the middle of the street. Or there was, there was actually the sewer main. So it's a giant thing that all the poop goes into to go to the, the uh, water treatment plant. And in the process, we were going through and pruning the roots so that the roots wouldn't get destroyed in the process of construction. And in one case, we found a birch that had managed to go six feet below ground, which normally, if we're looking at a tree, like say this is the side right here, right? Uh, we're looking at a tree horizontally and this is the soil. The roots won't grow any lower than two feet, typically speaking, that's the 14 centimeters, otherwise known as 60 centimeters, right? You won't find roots below this in most circumstances because this is where the most air is and this is where the most water is. 
And this is where the most nutrients typically is. Down below two feet, you have something called the subsoil. There's not a lot of nutrients there, so roots won't grow there unless there's water. And so if there's a leak, if you're watering, you know, if you build it, they will come. That's great. Um, we have a, a question from Chris. Can you plant native trees in a large planter if you have a small garden? Great question, Chris. You absolutely can. Um, what you need to bear in mind is the size of your planter and the, the health of the tree. So first thing that comes to my mind, if you planted a tamarack, which is generally a, a winter hardy tree in, uh, in a fairly large planter, like one that would say weigh 30 or 40 pounds, you certainly could do it and you could leave it outside for the winter, but you would want to make sure that you wrap the tree above and below. So you want to make sure that the soil in that planter doesn't freeze solid. That's the tricky part because if that soil freezes solid, then those roots will freeze. Naturally speaking, where we are in that two feet, for example, that two feet below the surface, um, the, the frost isn't going to get that deep and it's not going to affect the roots. And the roots to a certain degree have that resistance to the cold. Um, but if they're in a planter and they're not protected, and you get a couple of those cold days, especially like those deep winter, you know, those frigid days in February, um, that could do it if they're not protected. Okay, that's great. Um, this was a question from Kim. I have an ash tree that is self-seeded growing in my yard. Not sure if I should let it grow and hope the emerald ash board doesn't get it, or should I remove it now to avoid spending big bucks having it removed in the future? Great question. Um, so first of all, when it comes to big bucks and trees, I don't think you'll ever have to spend big bucks on an ash tree ever again, if you've removed them all, because they're never going to, um, it's a real tragedy. And I don't use that term lightly, that we've lost an entire genus of trees, like three to four species of trees gone. And I have said it before, I'll say it again, the, the white rhino is really important. Um, and it's in Africa, you know, and we, it gets a lot more press, uh, but uh, ash trees are amazing. They play an amazing role in our environment and in our ecosystem. And they're one of the only um, swamp species that you get in Northern Ontario. That's a, a, a broadleaf species, Ottawa Valley, perfect example. Tons, there used to be tons of ash there. Um, ash filled the natural niche that elm filled. And uh, now both are gone, really. Um, and the reason I say this is because if you leave an ash tree and you let it seed, uh, within 15 to 20 years, my estimates are that the tree's going to get hit with emerald ash borer again. And um, the wave has gone through, but it's, I think it's more like ripples in a pond than just one wave, right? And so we'll, if we try and grow ash trees again, EAB is, is not going to disappear. Um, even though we've introduced biological controls, um, which is a touchy subject for sure, um, I don't think it's completely gone. However, I think they're great trees and they're, they're rather fast growing. They're quite resistant. And if you leave it for a little while, let it go. Now, I will also say, just talking about the ID part, you're saying it, it's self-seeded. Be sure it's not a Manitoba maple. So ash trees and Manitoba maples are commonly confused with one another. Um, ash are native. The majority of them that we see are native. Uh, blue, white, red, and black. Black is quite rare. Um, blue is also quite rare, although we have it in some of our city parks. I'm not going to tell you guys where, but uh, if, if people are interested, you know, um, I'd be happy to talk about it because it's a kind of a secret experiment. Um, I say that he said to everybody. Um, but it is. It's one of those things that uh, I've even when I was an apprentice, I made that mistake countless times. And as, as a professional, I've had my apprentice make that mistake where it's like, oh yeah, okay, well, you know, we're just going to cut down this, this ash tree. And it's like, that's not an ash, it's a Manitoba maple. Uh, Manitoba maples are very invasive and they, they are, you'll blink and they'll be enormous. And their programming is that they get really big and then they fail. And that's how they work ecologically. They do it very well. Uh, but in the urban environment, they're terrible. So I would make sure that your ash tree, first of all, is an actual ash tree. So get a positive ID on that. And then furthermore, if it, if it is an ash tree, you could leave it. 
and it's not going to get that big. Uh, usually Emerald Ash Borer comes in as soon as the bark. So if you see, this is an ironwood here, but you see those grooves in the bark. Um, young ironwood bark doesn't have that. Very similar with ash trees. Young ash bark doesn't have grooves. When it becomes, uh, when it starts to reach maturity, those grooves start to form in the bark. And that's what Emerald Ash Borer lay their eggs in. And so the more mature ash are, are what play host to it. And so if you leave it, the tree gets to 10 centimeters, which is not a very large tree. 10 centimeters diameters in our industry is like tiny. Um, you know, it's nothing to remove it for any homeowner, really, or a landscaper. Um, and you can make the call at that point. But make sure you got an ash, not a, uh, not a Manitoba. I hope that helps. Yeah, and a quick, I guess, um, segue. Um, someone asked earlier about, because we started talking about the Emerald Ash Borer again, um, they asked, uh, this was from Francis, could you tell us more about um, spraying effects and if it has any impacts on other insects? Wonderful. Um, hi, Francis. Um, thank you for your question. So if we're talking about emerald ash borers, there's not really much spraying that's done to manage emerald ash borer. The, the main control of emerald ash borer is actually an ejection. Um, talk about doctors and surgery. Um, it's a, <laughs> injections being rather controversial nowadays. Um, the, <laughs> the emerald ash borer, uh, the, or the, sorry, the tree, treatment for the emerald ash borer, tria, triazine or triazin, which is the more common one. There's another one called the arborjet or arborject, I, forgive me, I can't remember exactly, um, is actually drilled and installed into the tree and, and is meant to be taken up by the tree's natural uh, system and get into the canopy and to sit in the cambium for a year to two years. And when the emerald ash borer larvae um, hatch and move, they actually absorb that, um, that control, I guess, for lack of a better word, into their system. And then they become null and void as far as we're concerned. Um, whereas spraying on the other hand, so any aerial application, that's something that we would do for something that's a little bit more um, widespread or for trying to hit a broader band. So that would be like gypsy moth. We'll do a, a spray, an aerial application of uh, BTK. So that's Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki. And that is specifically formulated, not formulated, specific, it exists naturally in the environment and it exists only to get caterpillars. Um, and so this is where like when we're talking about controls, you want to make sure you know what the control is and what the application is. So for uh, emerald ash borer, it is a semi, what we'd call in the industry, a semi-systemic pesticide, and it goes into the tray via injection. Um, whereas an aerial application or an aerosol, that is a different kind of pesticide. It's, an, it's a contact. Actually, it's BTK to be specific, it has to be consumed, but that's a, another story. And if you want to ask more about that, I'd be very happy to get into that because that's a question. Generally, pesticides is something that people have a lot of questions about. That's great, thank you. And um, Brian here had a question. Um, he said, I notice a lot of trees in city parks are weed whipped near the base. Oh, um, is yeah. this something you've heard about and what do you tell parks and rec to avoid this in the future? Thank you, Brian. Um, so there's, this is a common problem that I actually had. Uh, we do not deal with parks and rec. So in forestry, we are actually in the department roads, parks and forestry. And there are three, three parks departments in the city of Burlington. Now they all have different roles. One is parks planning. They, they're the ones who build parks, do improvements, manage risk in parks in regards to like playgrounds and what have you. Um, you know, playground needs to be updated, inspected. Parks and Rec is responsible for um, like the pools and, and park events facilitating um, goings on. And then RPF, which is my department is responsible for parks, the maintenance in the parks. So that would be, the string trimmers, that would be the mowing, that would be, you know, um, little Sally threw up in the wading pool or something to that effect. And so you were talking to the right guy and I'm, I am in that department and we are working on that. The, the unfortunate part is you damage a tree once, trees are perfect historians. Um, they remember, right? And so some of these trees were damaged four or five years ago. 
or 10 years ago. And this is what I was saying earlier. It's like, what do we do about this? Um, I'm trying to change it. This is a, and this is a planning as much as it is an operation and maintenance issue. Um, and one of the ways that we can do that is by mulching. Um, and so once you mulch, you don't have to worry about grass and residents who don't complain about grass also help because one of the the problems that we have is that people complain a lot about grass and weeds and if people complain about grass and weeds we have to go out and we have to whack the weeds and fortunately the trees get whacked in the process got you thank you <laughs> um i have here uh let's see um this is a question about fallen leaves this came from natalie is there an environmental benefit to leaving fallen leaves on the ground over the winter instead of raking them Great question, Natalie. I, I love this because this is, uh, it's very close to my heart. Um, it is, there, there are tons of benefits. Uh, so one of the interesting things I actually say to colleagues is if you want to know what the best thing for a tree is, go to Algonquin Park, you know, go, go to a conservation area, uh, go to where the trees live and see how they live. Um, nobody cleans up leaves around trees where they have lived for millions and millions of years. Um, grass generally doesn't grow around trees. Um, at, at our property out here, like my own personal property, we've had about 50 yards of mulch this season come in. Now I really like spreading mulch. I love getting in my little loader and, and doing it because I know it's really good for the trees. Um, but it was a bit of a discussion that I had to, you know, my, my wife trusts my skills and my judgment, but it was, it was like, oh, why are we mulching all of the trees? Like, because the trees should be mulched. This is how they naturally grow. Trees don't grow with grass around them. I've never seen a tree. I, I, I guess that's not true. It, I've seen maybe 3% of trees in, in the wild actually have grass and it's usually really rare or it's a campsite where human impact has gotten rid of a lot of the other trees nearby and grass has grown. Um, and so, yeah, leaving, leaving the leaves on your property is great for the soil. It's great for the trees. Um, the challenge that comes up in the city is that it's an aesthetic problem. Uh, people complain about it. People don't like it. I think it's, I think the big question is having a paradigm shift. Uh, the more spread out your leaves are, or the more mulched your leaves are, uh, the faster they'll break down. So if you mow your leaves after they've landed, um, it'll make them really small and it will help them to break down a little bit in your grass. Um, and so that's, uh, yeah, that's what I, I typically advise because one of the jokes that I, I used to hear a lot when I was in the industry on the private side of things, um, landscapers would always laugh because they would take, they'd be paid to take leaves out and droves off of people's properties. And then the next season, the people would be paying hand over fist for mulch. And it's like, you're paying for, we're just going to take your leaves and store them for the winter. And then we're going to sell them right back to you. And it, it it's a big market for that. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can just save, save the carbon of somebody coming in with a truck, you know, blowing those leaves around with a two stroke engine, putting it in a machine, driving it somewhere else to let it break down so that you can pay someone with another big machine to come back to your property and spread them out again. Uh, it, it seems counterintuitive to do it that way. Yes, for sure. Um, we've only got a couple left, so let's try to plow through them, get everyone out by 8.30, ideally. Here we go. Um, this is another one from Sharon. What is the typical lifespan of a silver birch? Ooh, okay. So uh, it's interesting that you say this. When you say silver birch, I imagine you're saying you're talking about a European birch or a betula pendula. Um, this is where names can be really tricky and why I... I You'll, you've probably heard me refer to Latin names a few times. Um, that helps to re reduce confusion. So I'm going to assume you mean a betula pendula. And in the urban environment, I would say your typical age of a, uh, oh, I wouldn't even say age so much as diameter class. And that's what we, that's how we determine um, tree size and tree 
I, I don't even need to say age, but that's how we determine a tree. Like if, if I'm talking to another professional and they say, oh, it was a 10 centimeter tree or a hundred centimeter tree. That gives me an idea of like, oh, a hundred centimeter tree is huge. I've only seen a few of those in my lifetime or especially in the city. Um, and so when we're talking about like a silver birch, I would say 40 centimeters DBH. DBH is diameter at breast height, which is considered 1.4 meters. So 1.4 meters off the ground, what is the diameter of the tree? Not the circumference, but the diameter. Um, 40 to 60 is like, that's really far off. Uh, that's a, a really rare European birch or betula pendula. Um, typically in the urban environment, you're going to find... Um, uh, bronze birch borer is a big one. So if you have a, a birch tree that's dying from the top down, um, that could be a sign of bronze birch borer, which is a relative of emerald ash borer, but bronze birch borer is native because not, not all bugs are bad, right? They just exist. And they're just like an invasive species is just doing its thing. All bugs are doing their thing. And unfortunately for us, they become pests. Uh, bronze birch borer is one of the, the major pests of, of silver birch. Additionally, uh, stink bugs. I remember pruning trees when I was on crew in Burlington and, and this time of year and uh, with a pole pruner and standing under the tree and just being rained on by this awful smell of stink bugs. Um, and those stink bugs are sucking the energy out of the leaves and they're stressing out the tree. And so those, those sorts of stresses, just like for humans, um, will factor into the quality of life and the length of life. And so if you have a really nice backyard, if you've mulched your silver birch, if you've had it pruned as it's needed and you have an arborist keeping an eye on it, you know, having, I usually advise people, if have an arborist that you know and trust, you don't need to get tree work every year, but have a visit every year, every two years, just to show up and say, hey, what's going on? Because my doctor knows to knows how to recognize problems in my body better than I do. Um, generally speaking, I know how to recognize problems in my doctor's trees better than, than she does. And, and so this is, this is the case as I walk on and say, Oh, that doesn't look right. And if you have an arborist, they can actually pick these problems out and deal with them before they become big problems. Because it's like, Oh, my knees, my knee hurts. I'm not going to do anything. Okay. Now my ankle hurts. Now my foot hurts. Now my hip hurts. It's getting worse and worse. And if you deal with it before it becomes a problem, it's just a knee problem. It doesn't have to become a whole leg problem. And just like with the birch, if you deal with it when it's a little problem, you can actually help expand the life of that tree. That's great. We'll take two more and I've got, I've got two here and a good one to finish with. So this la uh, second last one, can you speak to the role that trees play in stormwater management? Oh, yes. Who? 10 points to this person. From Leslie. Thank From you. From Leslie. Oh, man. I, I uh, double high five. That's awesome. Um, okay. So trees play a massive role in stormwater management. Um, one of the big problems that we have right now at the city, and it's, it's this particular conundrum because we want people to, we, we want people to have property rights. <laughs> we want them to be able to do what they want on their properties. Uh, but one of the troubles that comes up is if, if we allow, not that, that's not the right way to put it. If we lose porous surface, right? If we lose a sp space for water to go, um, it's, well, it's got to go somewhere, right? And so the more green area, the green infrastructure that we have, both grass and trees, the, the higher the stormwater retention capabilities of our urban green infrastructure. So if we have a property that it starts out as a small house that's taking up a quarter of the lot and say the lot is, um, say it's a massive lot because, or, you know, 100 meters by 100 meters, I don't know. Um, and it's taking up 10 square meters. That's a very small house. Um, but then somebody comes in, they remove that tree or that they remove that house and then they build concrete up to within half a meter of that entire property, all of the rain that lands on that property that used to go into the soil has to go somewhere else. And it could go into your basement, it could go into their basement, it could go into the road, it could go into the stream system, it could go into the stormwater system. And the stormwater system can only take so much volume. And the less area that that water can naturally run off, the more our gray infrastructure has to take it. So if we're talking about 
easiest example, because this is the only one I like to go evidence-based. So what does the science say? Um, willow trees can do a thousand liters of water in an hour in the springtime and then a day later in the season, a thousand liters. Now we're not planting willow street side because willows are really thirsty trees and, and their roots are quite invasive. Um, but we are planting trees in general. And so if you have a hundred centimeter red oak and I've, I've had residents who have actually said like, oh, I'm worried the tree's flooding my, my basement. Like, can you remove it? And I said, ma'am, if we remove this tree, you are going to have a flooded basement. Like you don't have one yet, you will. Uh, because that tree is sucking up all of the water that's around your house. And, and so, yeah, thousands and thousands of liters of water per tree per year. In, in stormwater diversion and retention. That's great. And then I think this is a good um, last closing one is uh, what is the one thing you wish people knew? And is there one skill you wish people had? Oh, I like that. Um, I, think, I think the one thing that I wish people knew I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be complicated and make this a two-parter. Um, I wish people knew that you can't replace a tree. Um, you take a 10 year old tree down, it's gonna take 10 years to replace it. And at that point you'd have a 20 year old tree. And it's, it's a real shame right now. Uh, for example, in the United States, um, in the urban areas, they're actually losing canopy at an alarming rate in cities because people are cutting them down privately. Um, and in a lot of these areas, when you cut down a hundred centimeter tree, you'll never get another hundred centimeter tree in a lifetime. And in a lot of circumstances, I wish people knew that bearing this in mind, it's actually a lot easier and a lot cheaper to preserve these trees. And it has way more financial benefit in the long run. If you look at all of the most wealthy neighborhoods in the country, all of them have trees and they're all big because Elon Musk, <laughs> I don't remember what the other guy's name is, Jeff Bezos, they can fly to Mars, but they can't build a tree. And it's, it's really cool. Like it's, it, we still haven't figured it out. We never will, right? Because these are organisms. These are organisms that outlive us. And I think if we if we actually had a, a case of, if people saw this, then it would be a very different scenario. And I think people are getting there, but it is, it's like, okay, how do we, what is it going to cost to preserve this tree? Oh, two or $3,000. You know, we, we need to do this instead. or We need to do that instead. Okay. Two or $3,000 sometimes is less than the cost of the removal of the tree, you know, and it just takes early consultation just to talk to a professional and say, hey, like, what do we need to do? Oh, okay, we need to just not make sure you don't drive a bloody backhoe into the roots. Oh, okay, that's not that hard, you know? Um, some, some circumstances, yes, absolutely. Trees need to come down when it comes to risk, but it's, it's a real shame when you get these big, beautiful, healthy trees that don't need to come down. And it's, uh, and it's so simple to fix or prevent. Um, and then there was a second question there, Kelly. Um, and that was just, uh, what skill, what skill do you wish people had? Um, I wish people had more like specifically outdoor skills in general. Um, but I guess in specific, just tree identification skills. Um, I remember once I know th this is going to sound like I'm going off the rails, which has pretty much been most of the night. Like, where's it going with this? Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I remember once I saw a, a philosopher who came to McMaster when I was doing my undergrad and somebody asked him the, the pot question. Yeah, like he was this lefty dude, uh, surprise, surprise. Um, but like, what do you know, like, what do you think about pot? And he was like, honestly, I wish people cared as much about every other plant that grows out here and knew the native plants. Um, then they did, you know, I wish they cared as much about that as they do about pot. You know, everybody, oh, there's my cat. Um, everybody really, like, we have such an amazing biodiversity down here in Southern Ontario. 
like tons of trees, tons of trees, more than we actually get out in BC, to be quite frank. The native tree species that we have here are far more diverse. And they're incredible. They do really cool things. Like, like, this this one right here, ironwood has some really cool properties to it as far as like being harder than than wood. Now it doesn't actually sink like people think, but it's incredibly tough. And a lot of ironwoods didn't get cut down by the Europeans when they arrived because they were too hard. The Europeans considered them useless. And I think there's a beauty in knowing that, that these trees were useless and because they were useless, they escaped the ax. And there's some really cool, massive ironwood gems through the province. Redbud is a source of food. You can eat the flowers. That's, a, that's not only that's a survival thing, that could be a cultural thing. That could be something that we could bake into, into our traditions, that we could bake into our history, literally bake into our history. And, and so there, there's some really cool things going on. Cucumber magnolia, this is a native tree. This is a native tree. No, most people, when we plant them on, on their front property. They're like, what is this? It's like, this is a magnolia. That's not a magnolia. I want the magnolia that isn't from North America. It's like, well, this is, this one grows, should be growing in our forests, right? We don't have any forests anymore, really. And, and so I, I think if everybody knew how to confidently identify their trees, and really in my industry, it is really skimmed over. There's a lot of arborists who don't care to ID trees once they get past the base, you know, the basic 10, oaks, beech, maple, birch, et cetera. Um, but really when you get into the specifics of the botany, it's fascinating and it really can build, you can build a cool relationship and an intimate relationship with the trees around you once you know what they are. Because once you, once you can identify them, it becomes easier to identify other trees. It's like learning a palette, right? Once you learn yellow, it's easier to say, okay, well, whatever isn't yellow is something else. Okay, so if it's not yellow, it might be green. Okay, now that I know yellow and green, I can identify yellow and green, and I know what everything else is based on my point of reference. Once you know 100 trees, when you see one that's really rare, you can say, wow, I've never seen that one. That's a cucumber magnolia in the wild. That's really cool. This place is special. And so I, I think if people knew how to confidently identify their trees, um, they would be opened up to the amazing forest that we have here. That was amazing. And I think that those were some really good points to kind of end on. You know, if you can keep your trees, keep your trees. I think that is super important. And um, I want to extend my sincerest thanks to Kyle for joining us tonight and sharing all of his knowledge about trees and answering all of our questions. I know there may have been a couple more that we didn't quite get to, but I think they were they were mostly covered in, in what Kyle spoke about tonight. Um, so thanks so much, Kyle, for, for sharing with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And before everybody takes off, I just want to get, let you know about a few things. Um, you know, right now we, our annual tree photo contest is officially open. So between now and October 10th, you can submit your tree photos for this fun contest. Um, once all the photos are in, we um, create an online board for people to start voting and choosing their top picks. And um, the winner will receive a $50 gift card to Conan Nurseries and of course bragging rights. So that, that doesn't hurt. <laughs> We also have our cleanup green up, it's still on and you can organize your own um, self-led litter cleanup to help make Burlington clean and green. We have supplies, free native plant seed packets, prizes and more. Um, and it's also a great way for students to earn some volunteer hours. And um, our make the switch contest is happening right now as well. We wanna know what switches you're making to live more softly on the earth. You can find out more about all of these um, events and uh, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter at burlingtongreen.org. And then just lastly, wanted to let people know about an upcoming event on, on this Saturday. From 1 to 3.30, there's a Burlington and Oakville climate event happening at the east side of Spencer Smith Park at the pier. And this is part of a global advocacy movement to help the planet move toward a sustainable future. There'll be musical performers, youth speakers, community art activities, and educational info on climate change and solutions. Um, so I'll include links to all of that stuff in a follow-up email that you should get probably tomorrow. And when you leave tonight, um, you should be directed to a post-event survey. Your feedback is so important to us. It let, lets us know how we're doing and how we can improve our experience for future events and activities. It only takes a minute and we'd really appreciate it if you're able to complete it. 
And then tonight's event was part of our Nature Friendly Burlington program, which is all about making connections between people and nature stronger. When the more we connect with nature, the more we appreciate it and in turn protect it. So thank you to Burlington Foundation and Nouveau Network for making this program and tonight's event possible. And again, thanks again to Kyle for taking the time to, to speak with us tonight. And thank you everyone for spending your evenings with us. I know we went a little bit over, but we got to almost all your questions. So we hope that it paid off. <laughs> um, Burlington Green is a registered charity and donations fuel the work we do in the community to help make it cleaner, greener, and more responsibly, environmentally responsible. If you would like to make a donation, you can do so at burlingtongreen.org. So that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye guys.